or someone you know lived or fought during World War II, then why not add your memories to the People's War website at bbc.co.uk slash www2 or call 08000 150 950 for more information. Journey to some amazing places with a season of inspirational summer music. The BBC Proms, live every night this week on BBC Radio 3. The very air we need to breathe is also killing us. Your DNA was discovered in the room where Tim Denby was shot. Time Machine and Waking the Dead, tonight from 8. Now on BBC One, a new experience for the Antiques Roadshow. This week, the Antiques Roadshow has left Britain's crowded motorways and travelled 3,000 miles to the capital of the second largest country on Earth, a country that spans six time zones and is bordered by three oceans. Born out of conflict between England and France, it is now an independent, affluent and cosmopolitan nation. I'm in Canada, and this is Ottawa. Canada has a federal system of government with many powers devolved to the provinces, but the really big decisions are made here on Parliament Hill. It was Queen Victoria who declared Ottawa the capital. Great for Ottawa, although Toronto and Montreal might not have been amused. Still, our present Queen remains the official head of state, and judging by the familiar pageantry, there's still pride in the British heritage. The name Ottawa comes from an Algonquin Indian tribe who hunted and traded furs in this area long before any Europeans arrived. The river Ottawa is one of three here, but the city prospered mainly because of a fourth waterway built by the British. The Rideau Canal was constructed between 1826 and 1832 by the Royal Engineers under the command of Lieutenant Colonel John By, who gave his name to the growing settlement of Bytown, which was his headquarters. Bytown later became Ottawa, and the canal, constructed with trade and defence in mind, is nowadays used for leisure and pleasure. In winter, it turns into the longest skating rink in the world. Around the time of the First World War, a number of artists who shared a love for the great Canadian outdoors got together and became known as the Group of Seven, Together, they created a distinctive Canadian look. This is one, it's called Guide's Home in Algonquin. And we're in the National Gallery of Canada, which has kindly agreed to host our roadshow. And our usual team is joined today by five local experts. They'll cast a knowing eye over whatever treasures this Canadian visit might reveal. Silver. Silver. Porcelain. Yep. Porcelain, glass. Yep. How are you going to take that? You got that safely? A journal by Alexander Mackenzie. All right. Explorers. You have got a mixture. Uh, you can get You're going to be very busy. I bought it from a dealer in London, Ontario. When? A year ago. And what did he sell it to you as? He didn't know. And what did you think it was? What do you think it is? Uh, uh, well, I knew it was a trembleuse because it's obvious. Right. A trembleuse being a cup which... Is for our lady with shaky hands. Which trembles. Yes. A trembleuse. Right, OK. Yes. And so that's there for walking down the long, dark corridors. Now, did he give you any idea of how old it was? Oh, he, he didn't say. If he, if he had an idea, he didn't say. 
I was on my own as far as that goes. What would you like it to be? I'd like it to be Chelsea. Why? Well, because I, I'm very interested in that particular period of English porcelain, and I had seen a picture like that in a book. Yeah, okay. And it was Chelsea. And of course, to be Chelsea, it would have to be 1745, mm -hmm. 1755, in that very early period when they produced whitewares. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to disappoint you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Be. Well. What else can it be? Well, my second guess was French. Can I ask how much you paid for it? I paid $100. $100 would in English be £40. Mm -hmm. To put you out of your misery. <laughs> It is French. Yes. It's Saint Cloud. Yes. A, a highly, highly desirable factory which has this slightly greenish mm -hmm. hue, but it is a really nice thing. And I love that handle. Gorgeous yes. handle with a curly bit at the end. Lovely thing. Um, well, a hundred dollars. It's not too bad, is it? Well, I like the cup. I think if you sold that in England, you would get somewhere in the region of um, 1,500 pounds for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today you'll be hearing valuations given in Canadian dollars and or pound sterling. And it might help you to know that at the time of this recording there are two and a quarter dollars to the pound. Well, we've had it about 35 years. Uh, we bought it from an old lady who was selling up all her things. And um, we understand it was in an Eaton's catalogue. I'm not quite sure when. Probably 1915, 1920. Right. Um, despite first appearances, we're not looking at a Tiffany lamp. No, no. Because no. I live in hope. No. But it's still a splendid looking lamp. Okay. Um, it gives the appearance of being um, in gilt bronze, but I'm afraid these appearances are a little bit deceptive. Because if you were to scratch your way through this, it would come up a silver colour. White metal. It's a white metal. Yeah. The shade, in actual fact, is almost like a streaked butterscotch. Maybe. Um, yeah. But this type of, of, of glass is, again, it tends to be identified with Tiffany. However, there were lots of manufacturers uh, in North America making this type of of, of lamp. I mean, uh, Pear Point is one name, Handel's another name, uh, and there were plenty of others because the demand was, you know, virtually insatiable. Yeah. Everybody who was anybody, Wonderful. certainly in the early 20th century, they wanted to have this lamp because they wanted it for statement, because it showed they were modern, because this lamp used electricity. And that was still relatively novel in around about 1915. Now, you mentioned Eaton's. Now, they're a name that was the equivalent in Canada that, let's say, maybe Harrods are. Or Selfridges. Or, or Selfridges. Yeah. Uh, yes. back in, they back probably in Britain. had the largest mail, mail order business in Canada. Did they so really? Their catalogues went from coast to coast. All the farmers bought through the catalogues, right. the people in the, on the prairies, that sort of thing. I understand. Now, the only thing that it doesn't benefit from at the moment is the fact that it's not lit. Because yep. I'm sure you know that it looks fabulous when it's lit. Yep. Its current value at the moment is about um, about three thousand Canadian dollars as it is, one and a half thousand pounds. Um, but I think when it's lit, uh, it's probably worth nearer four thousand Canadian dollars <laughs> because it looks that bit better, doesn't it? I mean, so I that's get, about two thousand pounds. I, I get another thousand dollars for a lamp. Bulb. Just for flicking <laughs> on that switch. Okay. My dad got them from uh, somebody for a pound of coffee in Berlin after the Second World War had ended, during the American occupancy of Germany. Right, right. So a pound of coffee. I wonder how much a pound of coffee was uh, in, in Germany at that time. I don't know. And it was probably his, his rations, would it have been, anyway? Yeah. So it was a good trade, do you think? I think so, yeah. We've had them on the wall ever since, so... These are uh, made of uh, porcelain almost certainly in Berlin. There were a number of factories in Berlin that produced wonderful quality porcelain plaques, and these are particularly good, uh, good subjects. And um, I would have thought, you know, the pair of uh, plaques are worth about seven to nine hundred dollars, two to three hundred pounds for oh, the pair. Excellent. But in a way, they're not really what I wanted to have a look at, because this boy is just marvelous, isn't he? Absolutely yeah. fantastic. It's been by my parents' fireplace ever since I can remember. And we've always called him our whistling boy. The whistling boy. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, he's, he's a well-known bronze, and he's called the moose siffleur, or the, sh the whistling ship's boy. Oh. Uh, so it, it's a well-known uh, figure. And 
conveniently for me, it's, I, I can see here that it's, it's signed uh, Shablevsky and dated 1889, and it's cast in Hamburg. And it's just a wonderful quality br bronze, isn't it? Yes. Um, you've got such characterization in it, haven't you? You know, normally they can be a bit stiff and rather formal, but here you, it, it captures the spirit of the boy so well, doesn't it? Yeah. His trousers are all a bit torn, but he, yeah. he's strutting his stuff. He's rather carefree, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he is, yeah. It, it's tremendous. Great quality thing. The colour on it is uh, very nice, too. It's been patinated to look like this. Obviously, when it's cast, it comes out a fairly plain colour, and they've, it's been coloured to look this rather nice sort of nutty brown colour. And you want to be very careful not to polish it uh, or do anything like that to it. Yeah, it's hard to tell my mother. <laughs> well, people do like polishing these things. <laughs> yes, no, you should avoid it. I mean, really, at best, a duster and a, a, you know, maybe a paintbrush to get in the, the nooks and crannies to get the dust out. And, uh, you know, had you ever wondered uh, how much it might be worth? Actually, not really. I, I wasn't even going to bring it. I was at my parents' uh, yesterday and... Um, I decided to sneak it out of the house so they don't know that it's missing yet. <laughs> oh, really? Gosh. But I always liked it, and I thought maybe it had a value. I wasn't sure. Well, it, it does. And, you know, obviously there are plenty of copies of it about, but this is a particularly nice one, a very nice cast. But I think this would make somewhere in the region of four to six thousand dollars. Fantastic. Uh, which is, you know, about two to three thousand pounds, something like that. Yeah. So, you know, My it's a, dad will be delighted. Yeah, yeah. So, it was a very good pound of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very well, much. Well, thanks for bringing it. It's wonderful. This really is such a very, very pretty box. I particularly love this lovely painted bouquet of flowers in the center. And this is surrounded by bird's eye maple. And then we have the brass inlay around the edge. So whatever's inside, I've got a feeling ought to be pretty good. Let's have a look. Wow, isn't that absolutely glorious? I, I mean, the detail of the back here with these lovely cut steel studs on silk and blue velvet, and the colors are just perfect, just like the day they were made. And it's so nice to see them in such wonderful, vibrant color. We've got everything here, from what I can see, is that a lady would need for, for sewing. Um, did you uh, inherit it? Yes. Um, what, recently? I inherited it from my mother-in-law, yes. who inherited it from her old maiden aunt, who lived in Halstead in Essex, in an right. old Georgian house called Moonshiny Hall, which I'm afraid now is demolished. Oh, well, they lived to a really ripe old age, about 98 or so, <laughs> both of them. Yeah. So. Well, it looks, judging by the condition, that this hasn't been used very much. And we've got things like a, a little vinaigrette here, mm -hmm. which I'll just see if it is marked. Yep, well that's got the maker's mark of Edward Smith, and that dates from 1860. So we've got a pretty good idea then that that's what this box dates from, because I can't see, looking at it, any other marks. And I particularly sort of like little details like this absolutely wonderful little miniature sampler there and what have we got here oh a, a chinese thread winder and mother of pearl just you know, beautifully engraved and all the rest of the things here are bobbins and uh, wool threads and a complete manicure set so it's a wonderfully complete set the collectors of sewing implements really go for this sort of thing. So I've got a, a, a pretty good idea that uh, this is probably worth in the region of $7,000, a little over £3,000. That's very nice. very nice. I am going to send you to see Eric, Eric? on miscellaneous. We need as many hands to this as we can get. There we go. Um, the style of this, the colours used, indicates to me that it could well have been made in France. You know what it's made of? Human hair. Right. When I took it home, I took the back off, and it was just 
loaded with dead bugs and insects and all creepy crawly things. And are they still there? No, 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 no. I hung it up and uh, I took an air gun and I blew it from both directions and everything just blew, blew away. away. It's a wonderful vision of decoration in the 19th century. I've seen this before. Indeed you have. <laughs> and I think it's quite remarkable that you remember my parts when you don't remember my face. Oh, I'm afraid I look at parts and I don't know the faces, but this is, it's a long time ago. It is too. I brought it to you about 20 years ago at least. And this is, of course, one of Granger's beautiful little miniature jugs. Like, absolutely beautiful. A seed of Worcester. There's Worcester Cathedral over the river. And this gorgeous scene, a beautiful little miniature jug. The artist, of course, is Frederick Marlett Bell Smith. Uh, he was a British artist. He's actually the son of John Bell Smith, who was also a British uh, oh, portrait. Oh, was son, was it? Oh, I. He was the son of I John Bell Smith. I thought they Bell were Smith. brothers. No, no, he was the son. Mm -hmm. um, Bell Smith traveled back and forth between England and Canada. And he's known actually for two subject matters. His British subject matters, such as we have here, Wet, wet Day, Westminster. He also is known as one of the, what we call the CPR painters. Upon the completion of the Canadian Pacific Railway, um, the CNR painters rather, he was uh, hired to, uh, well, along with a lot of other artists, to travel to Western Canada, paint the Western Canadian scenery for the Eastern market, who had never, of course had never seen it. So you see two subject matters of his come on the market on a fairly regular basis. Interestingly enough, one sells pretty much as well as the other. Um, it's very typical, as I say, of the British paintings. Nice element here with the uh, the two figures in prominence. Has all the features you'd want in a, a Bellsmith watercolor of this nature. And you could probably expect this to be worth, oh, I should think about maybe in the $5,000 range? $4,000 to $5,000? It's an early French-Canadian armchair called an os du mouton armchair. And os du mouton in, is translated as sheep horn, and that's why where the name is derived from because of that shape of the stretcher. It's a crossover Louis the Thirteenth to Louis the Fourteenth influence. The Louis the Fourteenth being the more flowing lines. The Louis the Thirteenth style was a more simple, uh, rectilinear form, very simple style. Louis the Fourteenth got into more flowing lines and. Uh, a little more carving and that kind of thing, and that's what this chair is. Uh, the low back and the arms coming out fully to the end dated earlier, and so this is probably mid 18th century. Because it has some original finish left, it has some old crackled varnish, it pushes it up in value. If it were completely stripped and refinished, it would be probably half the value that I'm going yeah. to tell you. Uh, this chair in the current marketplace in a Antique shop in Quebec would probably be around thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars. Thanks. It's a great chair, and I hope it passes on to more generations. Oh, we. Now these, of course, are not porcelain; they are enamel. But I've always had a soft spot for it, for enamel, and these are really um, charming examples. Do you know where they came from? I believe they come from uh, Vienna. They're Viennese enamels, and Indeed. I, when I first got them, I was able to. Uh, discover that uh, the mark on the bottom dated it to about 1872, this particular yeah. piece. Okay, well that, that makes absolute sense. There was a vogue, particularly in England, but also in uh, Germany and Austria uh, and France, called Historismus. Historismus? Historismus, which was looking back to earlier periods. And the Victorians were great ones for studying works of art of the past in a way which had never been done before. And they were particularly taken uh, in Vienna by the enamels of Limoges uh, from the Renaissance period. Oh, yeah. And they were using those techniques and indeed some of the, the designs uh, on pieces which were characteristically uh, 19th century and could never have been made uh, in the uh, earlier period. What's extraordinary is that the collectors in the 1870s and 1880s, and in fact right up until the 40s, were buying these pieces thinking they were old. Oh really? Yeah, they were fooled. And it's only recently that we've been able to sort out uh, the copies from the real thing. I mean this one we've got <clears throat> 
a rather curious shaped object. It, it's almost like a hip bath, doesn't it, really? I never really knew what it was. No. Uh, I thought maybe sugar. Uh, over the years, I've I, come to think of it as a, like a sugar boat. But no, it, I'm pretty sure this is a bonbon dish. Oh, okay. This would have been in the middle of a dining table, and it would have been pushed down the dining table from guest to guest, and they yeah. would have helped themselves to whatever. Right. Okay. So that's what this was for. It's been decorated on the inside with classical uh, subjects and a typical Renaissance scroll border. On the underside, <laughs> we've got a landscape, which runs all the way around. We've got the three wheels mounted on this silver you were talking about. And of course, although that's now tarnished and black, it would actually polish up. The other one is um, slightly more bizarre. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a grand piano, which we can lift up and find the keys. And then here, we... This is actually the key to it. The key to it. Opens up like that. And in here, we have a musical movement. Does the movement work? It used to work. I haven't tried it for about uh, five or six years, though. I do Somebody's the done here, a little but... bit of jiggery-pokery around here. That's not the original stop on there. Oh, really? OK. It's actually wound up. Just, can I try yes. something? Yes, you may. It may not work. <laughs> It's working. It's playing. Oh, shit. I can hear it. It's having a tinkle. Well, there we go. Okay. What's nice about it is that all the pins are in place, and those are all there. So often they're broken. Some child's gone in there and mashed it. Um, so it's in perfect working order, which is brilliant. I would get that stop worked out, and then. Um, because what should happen is that when you raise that, this stud comes up and it plays. This, I think, is slightly later. Um, I put this into the 1890s. Um, now, what did you pay for it, can I ask? Well, I got it about uh, 10 or so years ago and I paid uh, $3,000 for it. $3,000, that's what? 1,500 pounds. That was fine. That was perfectly sensible retail price. What about this one? This one I paid six hundred dollars for, so about that's three hundred pounds. Three hundred or a little less. Or less, isn't it? It's yes, two hundred and eighty pounds. Mm -hmm. That was really very good. You've done well on that mm -hmm. one. I mean, that would make what would that make? That would make fifteen hundred pounds, mm. which is three thousand dollars. So, yeah, so very nice. Thank you very much for letting me see them. Well, thank you very much for the information. Earlier, I was talking about the Canadian group of artists, the group of seven. And I'm happy to say that I am holding a painting by Tom Thompson, who was one of the founders of the group. Charlie Hill, you're the curator of Canadian art here. Is this a priceless object? Well, Tom Thompson certainly was a key figure in the early history of the movement, but uh, regrettably what you have is not by Tom Thompson, it's a fake. Uh, during the late 50s, there was a group of people in Toronto who very intentionally uh, faked works by Tom Thompson and other Canadian artists and passed them through the auction houses. And it all blew up in 63 when two of the figures were arrested and uh, charged and put in prison. So it was a scandal, not just someone doing homage? Not homage at all, though in fact intentionally I think this painting was one painted by an artist quite innocently and then handed over for an exhibition organized by, to be organized by these two people. And then they put a fake estate stamp on the back. So if you look at the back, you'll see here we have a good one and a good estate stamp which was designed after uh, Thompson's death in 1917 by J.H. MacDonald, a fellow painter. Um, you'll see on this stamp that the seven doesn't go down as far, that the curve of the base is in fact flatter, and there's also the top part is not as clearly defined. And what about the differences in the actual painting? What are the clues? Well, you'll see the impasto um, and the texture of this is much broader. Uh, the contrast of colour is less subtle, less sophisticated. Uh, the forms aren't as uh, sharply defined as they are in the original. Mind you, of course, this is a Thompson of one particular period. Not all Thompsons look alike. And in fact, one will find Thompsons with the name misspelled because somebody has put a name on later on, and yet it's good. So there are a lot of complications in uh, trying to define the authenticity of a Thompson sketch. So the crude imitation 
that I'm holding is presumably not worth a great deal. Uh, has an antiquarian interest. And what about the genuine? Uh, Thompson sketches of this quality go for between 150, 225,000 Canadian. Well, I've seen some strange pieces, but this takes the biscuit, I think. Uh -huh. it, it, it's just fascinating. It looks like a, a rather late version of a Carlton House desk. The sort of horseshoe part here, space, right. and all these little compartments. What's the family history? My mother bought it about 40 years ago in Montreal, right. and she's had it since then. She moved into a retirement residence three years ago and handed it down to me. Wonderful. And that's... And you use it as a, as a desk? As a desk. Well, yeah, I use it every day. Excellent. Well, these compartments slide backwards and forward, and the drawers pull out, and there is a clue that uh, perhaps the drawers aren't quite as old as they should be. Okay. The construction with little pins in here, you see? Right. And we have some little plywood... Bits on the bottom. ...on the bottom. And um, really, I think, rather nearer the 1920s okay. than earlier. However, if we look back at this thing, this is rosewood, and it has this moulding round here, which is a typical French moulding of the 1840s. 1830, 1840, 1850. This was very popular. Now, the legs. I mean, <laughs> there's something else, aren't they? Aren't they, they? Aren't they just wonderful? <laughs> They're fabulous. They'd look, look probably better on a piano, would you think? I was wondering if they're the original legs of this desk or if they've been added. I think they are the original for what this desk was originally. Oh. I.e., if you look here, we have a cut and a cut and another one there and a cut in the molding just there. And it's been shortened. Oh. And it was a piano. It was a piano? It was a piano, yes. An 1840s piano. I don't... <laughs> and there's that a piano. Is... You're right. Oh my goodness. I can't believe it. <laughs> I would have never, ever, ever guessed a piano. That's Wait okay. till I tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Now, value-wise, it, it, it's slightly difficult then, isn't it? <laughs> Shall we value it as a, as a very good-looking desk? Oh, I think so. I think we should, don't you? Right, because that's what it is today. Absolutely right. And in Britain, it would cost the best part of £800, which is probably the best part of $2,000. $2,000, right. Oh. Wow. Yes. That is surprising. <laughs> I mean, it is so surprising. I, I can't believe it. These are just fantastic wordy gigs. As far as we know, they were made in Athens, Ontario, a little village here in eastern Ontario, about in the 1890s, the way we figured it. We're mm -hmm. retired historians, so we are very concerned about the history of these pieces. And uh, they stood out in front of a, a blacksmith shop near the village until about 1930. And then uh, when the blacksmith shop closed, they were shunted off to the farm of the brother of the man who made them. And they just stayed there off in a chicken coop till we purchased them in the 1980s. Wow. They both appear to be made of uh, Ontario cedar. The paddles on this one, yeah, that looks like cedar too. Um, which is part of the reason they've lasted this long. They were purely whimsical, made to, to mount on a post, possibly even the top of a house, and they would, would uh, flail their arms in the wind. One paddle being this way, which would turn in the direction of the wind, and then the wind would catch this paddle and make the arms go around. And just purely whimsical, might tell the farmer what direction the wind was that day and how strong it was, but purely just straight pure folk art and uh, whimsies. I suspect that they, they may be a rendition of a Hessian soldier. Um, the hat, the red coat with the buttons. Um, 
just wonderful, wonderful Canadian folk art. We even invest them with imaginary personalities. We think of this fellow as Charlie, who went off to Toronto and lived it up and lost right. part of his hat. <laughs> and this fellow is more uptight, you see, and he's more or less whole. <laughs> he but, is. Uh, that's just playfulness on our part, I guess. I would estimate these to be worth 20 to 25,000 Canadian. 10,000 pounds, 10 to 11,000 pounds. Wow. wow, that's true. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes. We thank better you. be more respectful of them. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Well, the response of the antiquers of Ottawa has been truly astounding. The queues formed here this morning at 7 o'clock. The doors open at 9. It's now just about 3.30 in the afternoon, and still people are turning up. At this rate, the experts will be here until at least midnight. Nice little box, squeeze action, like most of them are, like that. And, I wonder. Uh, it's quite fun. I, I have a dresser set. Yeah. Hello. The rest would be nice. Now, what do we got? What uh, we got here? Yeah. What's the story uh, well, behind her? She turned up at an auction sale here in Ottawa of um, things belonging to the late uh, Nicholas Montserrat. Oh, the author? The author of The Cruel Sea. Yes. And the auction sale was advertised on a very stormy winter day, and hardly anybody turned up. My father and I happened to go together, and we got some lovely treasures, and included was this doll, and How for fantastic. which I paid $25. I'm sure I never would have had her otherwise. Yes. And she is a lady. I mean, you look at her face, and you, you think more than anything of those wonderful cartoons of the Gibson girls. I see. With the very uh, delicate features and the big bouffant yeah. hair. Um, I think she's absolutely charming. Underneath here, her, her dress really doesn't show off her figure to any no. great uh, extent because under here I can feel wonderful sort of curvaceous hourglass I figure. Um, and, and her legs, legs are wooden. Her legs are wooden um, and her body is made of um, sawdust filled, um, I think it's cotton. it's just cotton. Yeah. Uh, she's dressed uh, in a, probably her original costume. Yes. Let's see if there's anything to discover. Oh, there is a mark down there. Let's have a look. There we go. Oh, now somebody's very kindly filled yes, this I in. Yes, I did that. You went over it in pencil. Mm -hmm. So the mark tells us a lot. Um, first of all, it tells us the number of this particular face, but it also gives us a good indication of who the maker was. Uh, and I'm almost certain that the maker was a company called Hoiback, Gebruder Hoiback, who were based in Thuringia, which is the southern part of Germany, uh, where a lot of the doll makers set up their companies. And uh, the Hoiback company, in fact, was operating um, from about 1820. Uh, she would be dating probably from about 1900 mm -hmm. uh, and I think she's absolutely charming oh. I have to say she cost you $25 yeah, on that yes. dark stormy winter night right. have you wondered about her value oh, very much so yeah well I think that that was a really a, a good buy um, you probably knew it was at the time but the the value Indeed. now that $25 is now going to be $2,250 to maybe $2,800, which is sort of a thousand pounds to maybe 1,500 pounds. So well, it's, um, to know. she is a real treasure. And I think also, I have to say, particularly here in Ottawa, the story adds something yes, I'm sure it to would. the value. Yeah, thanks. You made my day. This is the most magnificent watercolor, and it's to me, the age of innocence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what I particularly like about it, it's one of, by one of the great illustrators yes. um, of, the, of the 20th century, English yes. illustrators, yes. Arthur Rackham. And it's clearly signed here, yes. Arthur Rackham, 1910. Yes. So even more poignant, just before the, the First World War. So it really is a, an age of innocence yes. before the century changed. Yes. So can you tell me a little bit about... Well, yes, my uh, great-grandmother, who was Australian, was quite an art um, collector, and she bought it as a wedding present for my grandmother, who was married at the end of 1910, so ah, they must have been the first really? um, owners. It always sat in the drawing room right. in the house in London, um, according to my uncle, who's now 89 and Gosh. remembers it as a child. Um, 
and then I was given it on my 18th birthday, and I've had it ever since. Did, did your family know Rackham? I think my grandmother got to know him, yes, because right. there is another one that isn't as, as clear as this, really? but yes, I think so. I mean, he illustrated some of the great books, you know, uh, Peter Pan Absolutely. and and so forth and so on. But I wonder, here yeah, it doesn't seem to be an illustration for a book, uh, this specific subject. I wonder if it's a picture of his children or. Well, I don't know. Except it does it does figure in this book oh, about right. Arthur Rackham. Oh, how um, there okay. is actually a, a, a picture of it here, but right. of a different from an illustration. A later version. Late for nineteen thirteen for his book of illustrations. And, and where is that? I know that the V and A, the Victorian, Victorian Albert, Albert. have wonderful. the copyright. I think because uh, yes. um, somebody sent come mm. to visit us yes. here in Canada and saw the picture, and when she was in the V and A. Uh -huh. Funny. She sent me a card from the gift shop. Oh, how lovely, how lovely. Um, I think it's absolutely yeah. wonderful. And Rackham's work is highly sought after. And if we just look on the back, yeah, we can see with his own handwriting, yes. Children by the Sea, Arthur Rackham, and then his address, Chocolate Gardens. Oh, yes, in Primrose Hill. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So I think that in itself is yes. wonderful. And, it's really and that, that's his signature, isn't it? I'd say absolutely. Well, I mean, Rackham's prices are being, uh, I mean, he's so sought after at the moment, therefore prices are extremely high for, for his work. And to see this wonderful sort of fresh, I mean, this this girl here is yeah. so beautiful, isn't it? Yes, I, I like this it's sort with of, the little with, sort of, I know, it's wonderful. Pantaloons. It's lovely. And it's sort of conjured up swallows and Amazons yes. and yes. lots of sort of family holidays on the beach, isn't it? Yes. I, I think that it's one of the most desirable Rackhams you will see Really? Um, it's just such a beautiful subject. That something like this, if it came up on the market, would make between thirty and forty thousand pounds minimum, God. which is, I'd almost say, seventy to hundred thousand Canadian dollars. Wow! It's an absolute God. peach, peach of a. I had no, absolutely <laughs> no idea. <laughs> well, wow! You know, logistically, these are extraordinarily difficult to make because there's no glue used at all. Mm -hmm. They are coopered in the traditional manner, and the whole thing is held together by these brass bands. And this is Dutch, by the way. Yes. Really cracking good example. It's got a, a typical half-size liner. They always sort of cut them off halfway down, mm -hmm. um, because obviously you couldn't get many, many bottles in with that tiny space at what the bottom. What was it used for? Wine. Wine? Wine bottles, yes. It's hmm. a bottle carrier. And what, what do you use it for? Well, at one point, I held my son's Lego in it. It was a toy bucket. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was valuable. Well, now, we haven't said it's valuable yet. Oh, okay. We haven't said it's valuable yet. But now I'll keep wine in it. Well, I should keep some wine in it, yes. if I were you, yes. Um, you, you, you've been actually using probably the most expensive, and I must say, it's quite valuable, really, the most expensive toy bucket. Really? Yes, it's worth... Certainly in the English market, right about two thousand pounds. Oh my God, two thousand pounds—that's mm -hmm. amazing. So it's been just been consigned to the back of the sewing basket. Yeah. So you never, never re really given it a second look. No, I haven't. Okay. Um, well, it's one of those objects. When I look at it, I want to give it not just a second look, but about twenty looks, because there's so much to see when you start looking very closely at it. First question is: although you've been using it for sewing needles. Do you know what it was used for originally? Assuming maybe a snuff box. I think you're on the right track there. I think it probably did start off life as a snuff box. But the thing that strikes you when you pick up something like this is just the fact that it's sheer perfection. It's beautifully decorated. If we just look at that top, um, this wonderful star decoration here, this entire sort of elliptical field. And then when you cast your eye into the borders, you notice that the, this, this actual top's beautifully chiselled and enamelled with semi-translucent enamels in what appears to be an, an aubergine and an emerald green. Um, so we're looking at a snuff box of quality. Turn it on its side and you get more of the same with these, these wonderful little pilasters, uh, again using scroll motifs, and it begs to be opened. And when you open it, uh, you'll find that um, you've got um, several marks here which tell me that this is French, um, which tell me that uh, this was made probably in around about 1780. Now, the person who owned this uh, would have been well-to-do. The chances are that the original owner um, probably lost his head to Madame Guillotine. Um, but um, having said that, I don't want to lose my head when it comes to, to valuation. 
uh, because uh, if I was to recommend a valuation on this particular box, it would be for somewhere in the region of £2,000 sterling, which is about 4000 Canadian dollars. So this has got to be probably the most expensive needle box uh, I'll probably handle today. And it probably won't handle many more needles. No. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. My grandfather left it to me a pile of years ago, about 30 years ago, but I can't trace it much farther than that. I don't know where my grandfather got it. And he, no story attached with it at all when you got it? No, I wish I had one. He was a big shot in the internal affairs and traveled all over the world, and I didn't know him much more than that because he passed away when I was young. Well, there's a bit of a government connection here in a way because if we look at this, and this cane has been carved, as we say, in the round, it's sort of telling a story, and it says, Sir John Douglas Sutherland Campbell, and it says the Marquis of Lorne here, and we see the initials G, G of C, and we believe that stands for the Governor General of Canada. It wasn't Governor General for very long, for a period of a year or something like that. Now, I could be wrong there. I'm do we expect perhaps that he made this, do you think, or had it made for him? I believe he had it made for him, but I mean, I'm just going by rumors, you know, right. I, I have no idea. It either could have been made as a commemorative piece for his time, or perhaps even made yeah. as a walking stick. This would have some historical value, but where its real value lies here in Canada is its nature as a piece of Canadian folk art. And it has just a fantastic surface. One of the things we look for in folk art is the old painted surface. Yeah. And there's just this terrific, terrific imagery on it. We've got, of course, the great Canadian symbol, the beaver here. We've got diamonds and hearts and this curious thing here. Yeah. This whole thing's been carved out of one single piece. And you're just seeing the carver's virtuosity here oh, of being able it. to carve this ball. Yeah. Really quite well done, quite remarkable. And the color is just, the, the preservation, all the different colors, I think it's just a just a delightful object you've never had it praised I have no idea not even a not even a small clue wasn't even hazard to guess no I would be too afraid to guess well you might be a little surprised here I think in British pounds we're looking at a neighborhood of about 2,500 British pounds in the neighborhood of four to six thousand Canadian dollars Wow Wow just a wonderful wonderful thing well thank you very much my mother uh, was very fond of it and used it a great deal. Right. Well, it's a very, very pretty chain, and it's actually Swiss. Well. This enameling is very, very typical, well. and the little gold links as well. Mm -hmm. And I think this would date from about 1830. Really? Mm. And um, for insurance purposes, I would estimate this at somewhere around 5,000 pounds or $10,000. Incredible. But now we come to the real star of the show. I bought this in New York uh, uh, 30 years ago or, or more ago and um, it, it was purported to have been made in, uh, in Prague in, in about 50, 1560. Well I think that's you know that is absolutely likely because the, the form of it and the way these emeralds have been cut yes. is typical of the 16th century as is this uh, beautiful enameling on the side and on the back. It's really in immaculate condition, I must say. It's, it's really survived beautifully. Jewelry of this period is very, very rare today. It very seldom comes on the market. Yeah. Uh, and I would estimate the value of this between 20 and 25,000 pounds. My gosh. Uh, which would be about $50,000. And what? About $50,000. About $30,000. Yeah. So it's... Uh, it's a really spectacular piece, and I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to see it. Well, thank you very much indeed. I'm most grateful. It's been a busy, busy day. And I have to hand it to the folk here for their enthusiasm, their patience, and their unfailing good humour. So, from Ottawa, and from our first Canadian Roadshow, goodbye. Next week, the road show's back on British soil at Winston Churchill's former home, Chartwell. Coming up tonight, the future is closer than you think. Board the time machine in 25 minutes after the news.